Here's what doesn't work to control stress. Telling yourself to calm down. In fact, that tends to just exacerbate stress. Telling someone else to calm down also tends to exacerbate their stress. If you want to reduce the magnitude of the stress response, the best thing you can do is as far as I am aware of, the best tools to reduce stress quickly, so-called real-time tools, are going to be tools that have a direct line to the so-called autonomic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system is really interesting. The parasympathetic nervous system has certain entry points, or what I'll call levers, right, that will allow you to push back on the stress response in real time and diminish it and feel more relaxed really quickly. So I'm going to teach you the first tool now so I don't overwhelm you with all this academic knowledge without giving you something useful. And the tool that, at least to my knowledge, is the fastest and most thoroughly grounded in physiology and neuroscience for calming down in a self-directed way is what's called the physiological sigh, S-I-G-H. Now, some of you might have heard me talk about this on previous podcasts, but I'm going to explain this in the context of how respiration in general is used to calm us down. And it turns out you're all doing this all the time, but you are doing it involuntarily. And when you stress, you tend to forget that you can also activate these systems voluntarily. This is an extremely powerful set of techniques that we know from scientific studies that are being done in my lab, Jack Feldman's lab at UCLA and others now that are very, very useful for reducing your stress response in real time. And here's how they work. These days, there seems to be a lot of interest in breath work. Breath work typically is when you go and you sit down or you lie down and you deliberately breathe in a particular way for a series of minutes in order to shift your physiology, access some states. And it does have some utility that we're going to talk about. That is not what I'm talking about now. What I'm talking about when I refer to physiological size is the very real medical school textbook relationship between the brain, the body, and the body as it relates to the breathing apparatus, meaning the diaphragm and lungs, and the heart. Let's take the hallmark of the stress response. The heart starts beating faster. Blood is shuttled to the big muscles of the body to move, move you away from whatever it is the stressor is or just make you feel like you need to move or talk. Your face goes flushed, etc. Heart rate, many of us feel, is involuntary. It just kind of functions whether or not we're moving fast or moving slow. If you think about it, it's not really purely autonomic because you can speed up your heart rate by running or you can slow it down by slowing down by sl your run. You can move to a walk or lie down, but that's indirect control. There is, however, a way in which you can breathe that directly controls your heart rate through the interactions between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Here's how it works. When you inhale, so whether or not it's through the nose or through the mouth, this skeletal muscle that's inside your body called the diaphragm it moves down and that's because the lungs expand the diaphragm moves down your heart actually gets a little bit bigger in that expanded space there's more space for the heart so i'm not talking about your emotional heart getting bigger i'm talking about your actual physical heart getting a little bit bigger the volume grows and as a consequence whatever blood is in there is now at a lower volume or moving a little bit more slowly in that larger volume than it was before you inhaled, okay? So more space, heart gets bigger, blood moves more slowly, and there's a little group of neurons called the sinoatrial node in the heart that registers, It's pay, believe it or not, those neurons pay attention to the rate of blood flow through the heart and send a signal up to the brain that blood is moving more slowly through the heart. The brain then sends a signal back to the heart to speed the heart up. So what this means is if you want your heart to beat faster, inhale longer, inhale more vigorously than your exhales. Now, there are a variety of ways that one could do that, but it doesn't matter if it's through the nose or through the mouth. If your inhales are longer than your exhales, you're speeding up your heart. If your inhales are more vigorous, so even if your inhales are shorter than your exhales, you are speeding up your heart rate. Now, the opposite is also true. If you want to slow your heart rate down, so stress response hits, you want to slow your heart rate down. What you want to do is, again, capitalize on this relationship between the body, the, meaning the diaphragm and the heart and the brain. Here's how it works. When you exhale, the diaphragm moves up. 
which makes the heart a little bit smaller. It actually gets a little more compact. Blood flows more quickly through that compact space, sort of like it's just a pipe getting smaller. The sinoatrial node registers that blood is going more quickly, sends a signal up to the brain, and the parasympathetic nervous system, some neurons in your brainstem, send a signal back to the heart to slow the heart down. So if you want to calm down quickly, you need to make your exhales longer and or more vigorous than your inhales. Now, the reason this is so attractive as a tool for controlling stress is that it works in real time. This doesn't involve a practice that you have to go and sit there and do anything separate from life. And emotions and stress happen in real time. And so while it's wonderful to have a breathwork practice or to have the opportunity to get a massage or sit in a sauna or do whatever it is that you do in order to set your stress controls in the right direction, having tools that you can reach to in real time that require no learning. I mean, I had to teach it to you. You had to learn that, but it doesn't require any plasticity to activate these pathways. So if you're feeling stressed, you still need to inhale, of course, but you need to lengthen your exhales. Now, there's a tool that capitalizes on this in a kind of unique way, a kind of a twist, which is the physiological sigh. The physiological sigh was discovered in the 30s. It's now been explored at the neurobiological level and mechanistically in far more detail by Jack Feldman's lab at UCLA, also Mark Krasno's lab at Stanford. And the physiological sigh is something that humans and animals do anytime they are about to fall asleep. You also do it throughout sleep from time to time when carbon dioxide, which we'll talk about in a moment, builds up too much in your system. And the physiological sigh is something that people naturally start doing when they've been crying and they're trying to recover some air or calm down, when they've been sobbing very hard, or when they are in claustrophobic environments. However, the amazing thing about this thing that we call the diaphragm, the skeletal muscle, is that it's an internal organ that you can control voluntarily, unlike your spleen or your heart or your... Uh, your pancreas where you can't just say, oh, I want to make my pancreas churn out a little more insulin right now. I'm just going to do that with my mind directly. You can't do that. You could do that by smelling a really good donut or something, but you can't just do it directly. You can move your diaphragm intentionally, right? You can do it anytime you want and it'll run in the background if you're not thinking about it. So this incredible pathway that goes from brain to diaphragm through what's called the phrenic nerve, P-H-R-E-N-I-C, phrenic, the phrenic nerve innervates the diaphragm. You can control anytime you want. You can double up your inhales or triple up your inhales. You can exhale more than your inhales, whatever you want to do. Such an incredible organ. And the physiological sigh is something that we do spontaneously, but when you're feeling stressed, you can do a double inhale. Long exhale. Now, I just told you a minute ago that if you inhale more than you exhale, you're going to speed the heart rate up which would promote more stress and activation. Now I'm telling you to do a double inhale, exhale in order to calm down. And the reason is the double inhale, exhale, which is the physiological sigh, takes advantage of the fact that when we do a double inhale, even if the second inhale is sneaking in just a tiny bit more air, because it's kind of hard to get two deep inhales back to back. You do big deep inhale and then another little one sneaking it in. The little sacs in your lungs, the alveoli of the lungs, your lungs aren't just two big bags, but you've got millions of little sacs throughout the, the lungs that actually make the surface area of your lungs as big as a tennis court. It's amazing. If we were to just spread that out. What, those tend to collapse as we get stressed. And carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide builds up in our bloodstream, and that's one of the reasons we feel agitated as well. So, And it makes us very jittery. I mean, there's some other effects of carbon dioxide I don't want to get into, but when you do the double inhale, exhale, the double inhale reinflates those little sacs of the lungs. And then when you do the long exhale, that long exhale is now much more effective at ridding your body and bloodstream of carbon dioxide, which relaxes you very quickly. Mm -hmm.